In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the refrigerant cycle. Now, the refrigerant cycle is how everything comes together and how the cooling actually works in anything that uses mechanical refrigeration, in other words, has a compressor. There's just some things we have to talk about first before we can talk about that whole process. The basis of how refrigeration works comes from water boiling and condensing. So at atmospheric pressure, I think we can all agree that water boils at 212 degrees. If the pressure drops, the boiling point will drop as well. And an example of this could be in the higher altitudes like Denver, Colorado. So if I go to Denver, which is 10,000 feet above sea level, the atmospheric pressure is quite a lot lower. The higher you go, the lower the atmospheric pressure. So my boiling point may only be at 200 degrees. So the basis of this is as pressure drops, the boiling point will drop as well. As pressure goes up, like in a pressure cooker, the boiling point goes up. So all refrigerants, which is just a conglomeration of chemicals, have a specified boiling point temperature at a specified atmospheric pressure. Couple things, the couple ones that come to mind, R134A, which you find in most of your motor vehicle air conditioning systems. At zero pounds per square inch gauge, PSIG, it will boil at negative 14 degrees. In other words, at room pressure, normal atmospheric pressure, if I put liquid refrigerant on a table, it's going to boil at a temperature of negative 14 degrees. R12, which has been phased out, has a boiling point of negative 20 degrees at zero PSIG. Gauge pressure is normal atmospheric pressure. So zero PSIG is 14.7 PSIA, which is absolute pressure. So knowing the boiling point, at zero PSIG, a chart can be created to show the boiling point at a variety of other pressures. Okay, and that's called the temperature pressure chart. So when we look at the chart on the next slide, what we want to do is find the column for the refrigerant. We're going to locate zero PSI or 0.1 PSIG. We're going to look to the left and find the temperature. Okay. Most systems do not run at temperatures this cold, so the pressures are increased by the use of a compressor, which makes the boiling point increase. So when we take a look at this temperature pressure chart, R134A is my column right here. Okay. So if I look here, okay, my R134A, is this column right here. Okay. Then if I come over to point one, which is as close as I can get to zero on this chart, by the way, as you go up, you're um, into negatives here. Okay, the bold is a negative. Okay, it's a vacuum. As you go down, it's a positive. So point one is a vacuum and it's negative point 15 degrees. Zero is actually someplace in between this 0.1 and 1.9. R410A, which is found at in most residential air conditioning systems and actually air conditioning, which is just another form of refrigeration. Zero PSI, okay, is someplace down around negative 50 degrees or actually lower than that, okay? So every refrigerant has a slightly different boiling point temperature. But that's a temperature pressure chart. Find the refrigerant, find the pressure you're looking at, come over to find the temperature, or find the temperature you want, come over and find the pressure you need to achieve that temperature. Now, we have a couple different refrigerants, as you saw from this chart. Okay, we have CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons. Old refrigerants, they're phased out. They contain chlorine, which is very bad for the ozone layer in our environment. HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, they're less harmful but because they contain some hydrogen, but they still contain chlorine. HFCs, which is our newer refrigerants, okay, supposedly they do not damage the ozone layer. 
you'll notice there's no chlorine in them anymore, hydrofluorocarbon. We also have to worry about refrigerant oils. It provides lubrication for the compressor. Polyol ester and alkyl benzene are synthetic oils. We also used to have mineral oils, and they were natural oils, but they don't work with the new refrigerant. So just be very careful to make sure the refrigeration oil you use matches the refrigerant. Refrigerant containers are color coded. Okay, there's some handouts in the course material for national refrigerants. You must know the colors for R22, 134A, 410A, 409A, 502, and R12. Those you need to have committed to memory. The oils used are very specific for the type of refrigerant. Try not to use the wrong oil with the refrigerant. It causes bad things in the compressors. So your basic system components we have to worry about consist of a compressor, condenser, a metering device, an evaporator coil, a liquid line, a suction line, a filter dryer, and sometimes sight glasses to let you know what's going on inside the system. But we'll talk more about that. The compressor compresses the refrigerant through the system. Okay, it takes a low pressure vapor refrigerant and it outputs a high pressure vapor refrigerant. The compressor does not pump liquid and that's very important to remember. Compressor is not a liquid pump. Compressors are also not meant to run in a vacuum. Running a compressor in a vacuum will damage the windings because it will actually cause the oil to boil, okay, and it will melt the insulation off the windings. Refrigerants provide the cooling for the compressor, okay. As the refrigerant flows through the compressor, it also absorbs the heat of the compressor, the heat of the compressor windings, and takes that with it. The condenser is the next part, okay. It rejects the heat from the system. It condenses a high pressure vapor into a high pressure liquid refrigerant, approximately 30 degrees above the ambient temperature. And again, this is very important to remember. It condenses a high pressure vapor to a high pressure liquid, approximately 30 degrees above the ambient temperature. In other words, if my outdoor temperature is 90 degrees on a summer day, my condensing point in that is 30 degrees higher. Okay, so we're talking 90 plus 30 is 120. So my condensing temperature is 120 degrees. So if I'm thinking back to that temperature pressure chart, or if you have one handy, I'm going to take that 120 degrees, find the refrigerant, and I can cross-reference it to the pressure that I should be seeing in the condenser. The metering device is the next flow. So we go compressor, condenser, metering device. It controls the flow of refrigerant entering the evaporator. It restricts the refrigerant, which starts the boiling process. Okay, think about a garden hose. You put your finger over the end of a garden hose. I have high pressure water in the garden hose backing up behind my finger, but I'm only allowing a little bit of that at one time to spray out onto whatever I'm trying to water. Okay, it's also could be considered a resistor in the electrical current, but with refrigerant, what's going on is now I have the high pressure liquid. All of a sudden, there's a pressure change, and this starts the boiling process because I go from a high pressure, and all of a sudden, I go drop pressure down to a very low pressure, and I'm going to start the boiling process because refrigerant boils at a lower pressure faster. The evaporator coil is next in the sequence. It absorbs the heat from whatever I'm trying to cool. Could be air, could be liquid, could be Slurpees at your 7-Eleven. Okay, I'm absorbing heat from the medium being cooled. And it uses that heat to cause the refrigerant to boil or evaporate into 100% low pressure vapor. So the heat that's being absorbed is actually being absorbed through that change of state. I'm changing the refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor by boiling it. Well, anything that's being boiled takes heat to boil. Okay. I also have the liquid line. It's the line that carries the high pressure liquid refrigerant from the condenser to the metering device. The suction line is the last part of our cycle. 
okay, it takes that low pressure vapor, in other words, 100% gas or vapor that's coming out of my evaporator and it returns it to the compressor. So think about the full circle we just did. We started off with the compressor. It increased the pressure of my vapor refrigerant. I went to the condenser. I took that high pressure vapor. I blew air across the outside of the condenser to remove heat. The removal of that heat caused that refrigerant to change from a vapor to a liquid. I come out of the condenser with my liquid line. The liquid refrigerant goes to the metering device. The metering device drops the pressure and causes the refrigerant to want to start to boil, which happens in the evaporator as it absorbs heat from whatever I'm trying to cool. And then once boiled off, the vapor refrigerant goes back to the suction line and starts the whole cycle over. Now, we also have an additional component called a filter dryer. It's a filter that's located on the liquid line, and it removes the moisture and any debris that is in the system. The drier material is the, made out of a silica gel or a molecular sieve, which both filters and absorbs moisture. The liquid line filter should be replaced any time a system is open. Think about it. There's humidity in the air. Any time you have to service a system that involves opening the refrigeration cycle, okay, recovering refrigerant out of it, brazing, fixing any leaks, you have to replace the filter dryer. There are also some special cleanup dryers and suction line core type dryers that are installed on systems that are badly contaminated. Also, check the directional arrows on filter dryers. Most are not bi-directional. You'll see an arrow on them. Make sure this is pointed away from the condenser, in other words, towards the evaporator with the flow of refrigerant. There are some different ones for heat pumps, but we're not gonna talk much about them now. Sight glasses are also located in the liquid line. It allows a view of the refrigerant flowing in the system. Now, the important part to remember is sight glasses are primarily there for the moisture indicator. Do not rely on a sight glass to charge a system. A clear sight glass can mean the system is either empty or full. Refrigerant doesn't have color. You cannot see it. It looks like water. And if a line is full of refrigerant, it's going to also look like it's empty to you when you're looking at the sight glass. Also, just because there's bubbles in a sight glass does not mean the system is empty or partially charged. Okay, always use your gauges. You're going to have customers occasionally call you and complain about seeing bubbles in that little sight glass thingy and assume it's a low charge. Don't rely on that. The only way to diagnose a refrigeration system is with superheating and subcooling, which we'll talk about in the future. So let's get back to the refrigerant cycle itself. Refrigerant leaves the compressor as a high pressure vapor in the discharge line. The heat from the compressor and the refrigerant is released into the condenser coil. At this pressure, the boiling point is much higher than the outdoor temperature or ambient air. As the heat is removed from the refrigerant, because heat's going to naturally go from the condenser to the outside air, because again, heat always moves from hot to cool. So as the heat is removed, it starts to condense into a liquid state. This is the heat of condensation. Once the refrigerant is 100% liquid, a sensible heat change occurs as the liquid subcools. The liquid line now carries the refrigerant to the metering device. The refrigerant is forced through a pinhole in the metering device, and we get a substance called flash gas. It's about 80% liquid, 20% vapor. As the refrigerant exits the metering device, it moves into the evaporator coil. The latent heat of evaporization now occurs. Okay, remember, latent heat is with a change of state. Okay, and latent heat is absorbed as the refrigerant boils off into a vapor. When the refrigerant is 100% vapor, a further sensible heat change will occur that increases the temperature of the vapor. This is called superheat. Sensible heat remembers heat you can measure and feel. The superheated vapor returns to the compressor through the suction line. Okay, so I've used a couple terms here. One of them is superheat. Okay, this you have to remember. A superheat is a sensible heat change that occurs in approximately the last pass of the tubing at the evaporator coil. 
its sensible heat gain once the latent heat change has been completed. The latent heat change is the liquid changing to a gas. When superheat is normal, the heat transfer from the evaporator coil is working properly. Okay, superheat is in refrigeration is normally between 8 and 12 degrees. Subcooling is a sensible heat change in the condenser coil following the change of state. In other words, I take my vapor coming out of the compressor, I reject the heat, and I take it to a liquid. As it cools further, that is subcooling. After the condenser coil completely condenses the high pressure, okay, high temperature vapor to a high pressure liquid, the temperature should drop an additional 10 to 20 degrees as it enters the liquid line. This additional drop is called subcooling. So in this lesson, we talked about a couple really important things. First of all, we talked about the temperature pressure chart, which you're going to get a lot more practice with. Then we talked about the three different types of refrigeration, CFCs, HCFCs, and HFCs. CFCs have practically almost gone away, but you still need to know what they are. Then we talked about the major components of the refrigeration cycle, the compressor, the condenser, the metering device, the evaporator, the liquid line, the suction line, the filter dryer, and the sight glass. And then we went through again the entire refrigeration cycle. Now, when you look at the refrigeration cycle, you can look at it as a full circle. Refrigerant is never used up. It just gets recycled. There's two points of pressure changes, the compressor, which raises the pressure, and the metering device, which drops the pressure. And that's it for this presentation.